They're two and a quarter miles. We'll deploy the swimmers, as you heard Paul Haney said, say just after 11.30 Eastern Standard Time, about 12 to 14 minutes from now. In uh, Houston, the acting head of the space program, uh, Dr. Thomas O. Payne, has said uh, that, of course, uh, that he exults in the success of this mission, and uh, he says also this, this is the beginning of a movement that will never stop. Man has started his drive out into the universe. A hundred thousand miles from Earth, there is no room for a space race, no place for Russian-American competition. This is something for all mankind. Now back to Paul Haney. Now this is the primary leader, uh, Apollo 8, good advice to expect to uh, call uh, 296 uh This is Apollo Control at Houston. That begins to make you understand the size of our communication problem. It isn't a, a matter of just understanding every other word. It's a case of trying to understand a piece of every other conversation. But we're cheered up and we feel good. We know the crew is feeling fine. And uh, within a very few minutes, swimmers will be in the water. And we should start the movement of the crew into the helicopters and over to the Yorktown. This is Apollo Control at Houston. So we got perfect communications from the from two and a half miles from the Yorktown or a thousand fifty miles from Hawaii. Uh, they will have better communication from the Yorktown itself and you did hear a moment ago from uh, Dallas Townsend and Ron Nesson reporting from the decks of the Yorktown by way of the Pacific Satellite with uh, color pictures from there, no less. A uh, remarkable feat of communications in itself. But nothing, of course, in, uh, matches the fabulous feat of Apollo 8. All the way out to the moon, around the moon ten times, television pictures twice uh, from the spacecraft just 70 miles over the surface of the moon, Four other television transmissions, two on the way out, two on the way back. Presumably they got good motion pictures and strip photographs of the moon's surface. They had a good look at the preferred site for landing a man on the moon, and they're coming home with all of their scientific data. What they proved out primarily in Apollo 8 is that the flight could be done. Now the next step is to put man on the surface of the moon itself. The next flight of the Apollo uh, spacecraft series, Apollo 9, is scheduled for late February or early March. That is to go into orbit around the Earth and test out the lunar module, the smaller spacecraft that will detach itself from the larger Apollo 8 command module and land on the moon's surface and then blast off again to return the two men who go to the moon back to the waiting astronauts circling the moon in the command module. Now that uh, test will be in Earth orbit, uh, as we said. The spacecraft uh, will separate uh, and pick up the lunar module from the uh, Saturn 4B, uh, third stage of the rocket and the LEM adapter. That is a lunar module adapter. It will uh, uh, then uh, drop that uh, lunar module in Earth orbit down a few thousand feet and it'll come back and rendezvous for the test. Then uh, perhaps in uh, April or May, more likely the middle of May, uh, the Apollo 10 
with Tom Stafford in command, will go out to the moon with a lunar module, if that first test works out all right. Circle the moon again, as did this flight, and let the lunar module down to 50,000 feet of the moon's surface. It is not supposed to land. Now, there's been a lot of eyebrow raising and uh, some sort of knowing smiles around the manned space center about that flight, as if when they get down to 50,000 feet above the moon, they're going to go on down and make the landing there. But uh, just today, Tom Paine, the uh, acting head of NASA, said he does not favor such an operation, that he favors that uh, test down to about 10 miles from the moon's surface before they make the landing in Apollo 11, which would be in the middle. go cheese it's made of american cheese <laughs> uh, they these fellows uh, their sense of humor has been uh, developing rather rapidly since they've made the flight around the moon and started back home again uh, yesterday bill anders said that he thought he was hearing music and he wasn't hearing any and he said for goodness sakes don't let the doctors know that and then a little later on he did hear music and he said if that's really uh, music you're piping up to us uh, i just as soon not hear it uh, but uh, all in a joking mood. Bill Stout and uh, Leo Krupp, uh, perhaps for the last time in these long six days of this flight, uh, could we switch? Sure. Walter, that the uh, Borman level and Andrews had to go through. The, uh, the beacons, the light we keep hearing about that the chopper pilot uh, zeroed in on, and the, the float, float bags, you call them, flotation gear. Hmm? Leo, can you show us those? Well, the first thing that uh, Frank did as soon as they touched down on the water was release the main chute with this switch here. And evidently, uh, he did it uh, rather rapidly because the vehicle was not pulled over into stable two, so we should have some good window samples this time. As soon as they're on the water, their next concern was to get fresh air into the cockpit. So they pull that valve there, which opens up uh, two openings on the upper deck. And then with a fan over on my panel, we get air through those three through post landing these. ventilation ducts. That's what all these are here for, is that's, to bring in air after landing. That's mm -hmm. true. Now over on this panel, this is the switch that turns the fan on. It'll control how much air we get into the cockpit. This turns on the beacon's light, which is the flashing light that the helicopters picked up. And uh, this switch here is the dye marker, which they've deployed, which also opens up the receptacle for the swimmer's umbilical. When the swimmers get in the water, they'll be able to plug in a telephone and talk directly to the crew in the cockpit. Uh, since they stayed in stable one, they had to wait 10 minutes to allow the outside of the vehicle to cool off. But as soon as that 10 minutes uh, cooling period had elapsed, uh, Frank would fill both all of his three uh, float bags, which would then prevent the vehicle from tipping over into uh, stable two. On the Yorktown, they were talking about getting rid of the fuel that was left in the, uh, in the spacecraft. Is, is that a, a, a ticklish operation? Uh, Bill? Uh, Bill yes, and Leo, I, I, I just want to interrupt you half a second here to tell you that... ...and do they expect the swimmers to be dropping from the helicopters any minute now? Go ahead. Oh, we just heard uh, that the swimmers will go into the water in four to five minutes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, I was just proposition. Uh, no, the fuel regular RCS engines, and the way that is done is, uh, as soon as the main chutes are deployed, Frank just throws this logic switch and the dump switch. That allows the the remaining propellants to flow into the uh, to ten of the twelve engines. There are two pitch engines we don't fire because we don't want to get any fumes back into the cockpit. But through the other 10 engines, we run all the fuel and completely burn it all out. When, it, uh, when the engine stops firing, then we throw a purge switch, which is this switch here, which completely purges the line. This minimizes the possibility of a fire uh, in the event one of the lines should rump, uh, rupture on touchdown. So at this point, the only real risk is uh, seasickness, I suppose. Uh, mm -hmm. After all that time in weightlessness, uh, I imagine four-foot swells are kind of hard to take. Lovell better not get sick being a Navy captain. You know, Walter, the, it's really kind of an old home week for Leo. The Yorktown was his carrier during the war. I didn't know that, but uh, congratulations, Leo. <laughs> Thank the, you. Uh, Yorktown is, what is she? She's a... Uh, 
Well, that's, I, she's about 25 years old, isn't that's it? That's CV-10, Walter, and that's the fighting lady of World War II fame. All right. <laughs> you get in that plug. Yes, sir. The I would the... like to say also that uh, I feel real proud of the NASA job that's been performed on this flight. Uh, they've demonstrated that they can thread a needle with this spacecraft anywhere in flight, and I know that the confidence of, of all Americans, and especially the astronaut crews, is going to be uh, greatly elated over this particular flight because the the NASA team, the controllers, the tracking station, their trajectory people have just done an outstanding job.